Um, this one's called Design for Success. Uh, and a lot of you, well, I'm sure many of you, by the way, hey, I'm Marco Cepi. I'm sure to introduce myself first, I guess. I'm really good at speaking. Uh, I work on the developer experience team again, like I said before. Uh, so a lot of you who have gotten into the Juju ecosystem have probably already seen a video of me talking on and rambling about Juju, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a culmination of all those videos into one nice, condensed, hopefully concise format for you all. Uh, for many of you, it'll be a review of the current architecture. For many of you, it'll be an introduction. And for a few of you, it'll just be a reminder. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to walk through basically setting you all up for success, not just for writing charms and Juju, but for this conference. Um, just like any other tool out there, Juju has a set of terminology, a set of uh, just a set of things that it does. So this is just a review of that architecture so that we can start talking about the really exciting things. So I'm going to lead off with a boring talk, talk to kind of softball pitch all the rest of the amazing stuff we're going to cover this week. So without further ado, we'll do just a brief overview of Juju. Um, so we've called Juju many things in the past, but for the most part, what Juju aims to do is it aims to model, execute, scale, and manage workloads and services across an environment, whether that's bare metal, whether that's a private OpenStack cloud, whether that's a public OpenStack cloud, whether it's a public cloud in general, it just means to manage, deploy, scale, and execute workloads against a set of machines. Um, so let me go ahead and break down each of these components. So we talk about model a lot. Model is something that is more or less a solved problem. If you have graph paper to pencil, you can write a model. Um, but in order to get to the more interesting things, in order to manage this complexity, Juju first must model the intent of your, of your workload, whether you're deploying OpenStack, which in of itself is a rather complex series of components that are all interconnected, uh, or you're doing something a little more classical, like a three-tier web setup from a database to a web service to a load balancer. All of those involve a modeling and the understanding. So Juju not only models your expected workload deployment, but models how each one of those services should react during the life cycle of that service. Um, so the next thing is execute. So you model your, your idea and you want to execute that. And that execution is the key portion. It's taking that model and it's applying it to physical resources, whether they're virtual machines running in a, in a cloud environment, whether it's bare metal, whether it's LXC containers or anything else. It's, it's a system and you're deploying and executing that intended vision to that. And Juju will go and take your model and rectify constantly to make sure it is deploying what you've envisioned and designed. Uh, from there, there's always scale, and scale and the next one kind of collide with each other. Scaling and maintaining are more or less the same thing, or managing. But Juju allows you to take that model and to continue to grow that model as you need to reply, as you need to respond to demand, whether that's scaling horizontally up, down, or by scaling by adding additional services to support what you're deploying. Uh, finally, there's the manage, and this is something that Juju does uh, and kind of unique compared to a lot of the tools in the current ecosystem is it manages the life cycle of the deployment over time. Uh, so whether it's taking actions to mutate that model, to add services to that model, to actually mutate what it means to be that service you've deployed, uh, taking it, changing configuration for it, redefining what that model uh, means inside of your architecture, Juju allows you to do that as well. Um, so with that, we've kind of covered basically what Juju as tools intended to do. We might as well start covering some of the terminology. And I've already used some of them in the previous slides, but I just want to go over what we mean when we talk about charms, services, units, relations, configuration, all of that stuff. What does that mean in a Juju context? So real quickly, I just want to cover kind of the couple of things on this slide here. Some of these boxes may look familiar if you've used the things like the Juju GUI and stuff, which I'll show in a little bit. But Juju defines everything, Juju defines a service. And a service is a definition of machines that are all working to a common and same goal. Um, for instance, this could be a database service, it could be a web service, it could be Keystone, it could be Apache Hadoop. Uh, it is a service in the definition that it is supplying one thing. And inside of that service, you could have units. We have units, one or more units. So this would be the idea of scaling out that service, having Apache Hadoop deployed across several nodes, having a Keystone in an HA configuration, having Nova Compute across several pieces of hardware. So the service embodies units underneath it. These are all called peers. They all have the same code, which is the charm code, which comprises the definition of that service. So charm is the final definition of the service, and each unit has a copy of that code, so they all have the same exact charm running on them. Each group of peers, each group has an elected leader. Juju elects a leader to do 
more complicated pieces of orchestration within that group of services. So if you have things like uh, Cassandra, which has an idea of an elected leader or a, a if you have peering or clustering needs, things that would normally be typically handled by a quorum where either software is electing or you're defining a leader within that relation to help drive out actions to the other peers in that service. Juju helps define and illuminate which one of those units it's elected as a leader. Um, and Juju does the work required. Whenever a leader goes away and disappears, it'll help and re-elect the new leader and decide and implement quorum for you. Um, finally, what you have, the last piece of this is this relation line. And this is the real strength of the model is We've defined services, we've defined a database, we've defined what Keystone does and how to install Keystone and how to manage Keystone over time. But until you actually define how Keystone connects to MySQL, to the Nova Cloud Controller, to all the other components in OpenStack, how Tez and Pig and um, Kafka all connect to Apache Hadoop Processing and HDFS, how all that happens is through this relation. This relation is a connection between services on an agreed upon protocol so that you can talk and send information directly from each service. This is a service-based orchestration model where when connected to each other, when I connect MySQL to Keystone, when I connect Tez to, I don't want to make a wrong mistake, big data people are gonna crucify me. HDFS. When I connect HDFS to Apache, uh, Hadoop, there we go. Uh, what these do is these services know how to respond to that request and provide the credentials needed and the information needed in order to facilitate that communication back and forth to each other. MySQL will tell, here's your database settings, and here's your configuration for it, and here's the user you can access it, directly to the application, that, sorry, not to the application, directly to the charm, and those units can then consume that data and respond appropriately to it. So you've got a, I wouldn't necessarily say a decentralized orchestration, but you have a service peer-to-peer -peer orchestration model within Juju. Uh, and then in addition to that, I've kind of outlined in the bottom here, is that each service embodies, each service also embodies these additional models, you can model configuration, um, action, storage, and networking, which are all things that I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. But these are the terminology that will be easy the rest of the slide. And throughout the rest of the conference, you'll people saying things like peers, uh, you have units, services, charms, relations. There are leaderships, configuration, action, storage, and networking. These are all things that are part of the Juju and the charm model. Uh, so that leads us pretty well into charms. And charms are the operational code that you use in order to manage and install a service throughout its entire life cycle. So it's more than just running an app get install, it's how do I handle, how do I model configuration so the user can change configuration? How does this service connect with other services? Um, what happens when I have more than one unit running? All that code, all that operational knowledge is condensed down into code within a charm. Um, and more or less what we like to summarize it as is the executable white paper. Everything you'd write in a wiki page for your company, everything you'd write as a white paper to publish, all of the knowledge you'd normally distill to run your code and operate, to run your service in, op in your production operation would be distilled as code inside of a charm. So each charm essentially advertises exactly what it does. And this is a, an example of a charm definition. Um, so each charm has one of these files that more or less summarizes what it is and how it connects to everything in the ecosystem. So here's just an example. Web app deploys a web application. I maintain it. Um, it provides something that speaks HTTP and it requires something that speaks on a PSQL uh, database. So the idea here is that this is modeling how that charm connects with the larger ecosystem. It's saying that I, as a service, provide an HTTP endpoint that things can connect to and consume, and I require, in order to operate properly, a Postgres database. Um, and what you get when you do this is, as in the ecosystem of charms, there are other charms that exist with similar metadata files that describe what it does in its operation. So I have my web app here, which is the same file I've, I've outlined before. And on the right is a condensed version of the Postgres file. And Postgres say that I, as a Postgres service, when running and fully operational, provide a PSQL, that type of that? Oh, yeah. PSQL interface, PGSQL interface. So in Juju, when I go and connect these two services, Juju says there is an actual protocol for communication between these two services. It matches based on that. And when I do so, Juju will handle that communication between those two services. So in this example, Postgres will give me a schema, a user, a password, the port, and the host name to access all that stuff. 
and it will, through Juju, transmit it to the charm, where the charm can take that data and react necessarily. So the web app can take it, write a configuration file, reboot services, and then I now have a database that I can consume. And since we're modeling each of these components individually, we can scale and manage each component in, that, in our workload. So taking that, we can actually build this, which is the next step, is the model that Juju executes. This is an example of a service that I want to stand up, a, a workload, which is, as I described before, I have a Postgres service that I want three units of, so I want it scaled in an H-shaped mode. I have a web service, which I'm calling Webhead, which is based on my web app I showed you, and I want one unit of this. I have to tell Juju these are the relations. I want my Postgres DB and my Webheads to connect the database. These are the relations I have defined in Juju. I, my Postgres interface is called database for my service. Postgres calls it DB in here. So when I execute this model, Juju will know exactly how I want these services to communicate with each other, and then the model and the charms take care of the rest of the execution for me. So this is what that looks like at the end of the day. Um, I saved that file as bundle.yaml. I run Juju Quick Start. And then a few moments when I run Juju Status, I see that I have two services running, Webhead and Postgres. I then have four total units. I have one Webhead and the three Postgres that I requested. I can see their states. I can see they're all idle, ready to go. And then I see, well, I can't really see kind of, kind of truncated, but the machines that actually comprise this, this deployment. So the idea behind Juju is I model exactly how my service is deployed and managed over time as a charm. Those charms are reusable components that I can then define a workload with. I can take that workload, that model, and execute it against any cloud provider, whether it's bare metal, virtual machines, uh, public private clouds, um, uh, machine you have SSH to as an example. And Juju will then go and rectify that model against the hardware I've provided it. In essence, that's taking my static definition and making it a living deployment. So Juju does this, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how Juju actually manages this for us. So Juju manages this in a event, um, it's an event-driven system of sorts. So the idea is that everything that I do as an operator, every action I take, every time I describe a model to it, every time I do a mutation to a service, every time I scale a service, every time I modify or add or relate new services, Juju takes that input and transcribes to low-level events that are then passed on directly to each charm and service to respond to. So Juju is publishing these events and translating my intent from deploying a service to all the events that it needs to run in order for that service to model that in its life cycle. Um, charms do this by executing hooks based on these, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so some examples of events that are published in the Juju ecosystem, uh, Juju deployment are things like install, configuration changed, starting and stopping a service, a database, a relation has changed its information, a leader has been elected from our pool, or storage has been attached to our service. All of these are example events that occur and that can be modeled and that can be written to within side of a charm definition. So charm, again, that operational code, you simply, Juju will publish these set of events that will, can occur inside of a deployment, you then write code to respond to those. Uh, so, We'll talk a little bit more about the charm structure. Um, so if you've ever looked at a charm yet, or if you haven't, you'll see something very similar to a structure like this. This is a, a condensed version of a sample charm. Um, it is essentially a collection of files and directories that follow a somewhat normal naming structure. Um, most importantly is that every charm will have a metadata YAML file. This is, again, the metadata file I've been showing before. This describes what the charm is and how it connects to other players within the ecosystem, other services within that ecosystem. Um, from there, we have a hooks directory, and hooks is where we write the code to respond to the events occurring within a Juju uh, deployment. And then we also have things like a configuration file, which allows us to expose service level configuration to the user to make modifications on. Uh, things like testing, uh, defining storage and plugins. Um, here's kind of a more condensed list of things that we'll come across, and I'm going to go into these at a higher level in just a few minutes, but you have things like actions, which are one, which are one-off administrative tasks. Things like um, creating a user on the system or generating a backup. Uh, things that you normally do during the life cycle of a service for administration work is then now modeled within a Juju charm, so that you can repeatedly and reliably run those tasks uh, when you need to initiate them. Uh, you have configuration, which is the service-level configuration, which 
discuss in a second. Things like a copyright, which is the copyright for the charm code itself. Uh, when you look at charms, what they are, and what I'll discuss about it in a second, is they, they are essentially software projects. They have uh, licensing for the files you're writing. They have code within them that executes uh, they also have tests or semblance of tests so you can validate that your charm code is working. They are, they are the companion software project to your deployment, um, to the service you're deploying. These are, this is the operational code instilled as a project for deployment. Um, things like a readme, um, testing, uh, et cetera. So the first thing we'll talk about is actions. And actions are a relatively new feature. It's one we've been exercising a lot. Uh, the OpenStack charmers have been adding them to do things like deploying OpenStack from tip of trunk um, and keeping that a crisp process. We have uh, a lot of actions and charms now that are kind of allowing you to do things like benchmarking. Uh, Big Data's been adding um, actions to charms to allow you to do exercising of normal administrative tasks against your Big Data deployments. Uh, same with things like uh, Docker and containers and such, where you can define, I, want, I wish to launch this Docker container within this service. Um, these are all just tasks that are managed in the model with Juju that allow you to do, as an administrator and, and as an operator, you'll be, you would be envisioning a user to do against your, 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 your service. So whether it's a rebalance of the disks or, or anything that would need to be run, anything you normally would SSH into a machine to run, you can distill that as code within the Juju model. Um, so here's just an example of an action, restart Apache, uh, just as a, as a brief following our web, the my web charm that I wrote. The idea is that I can enqueue an action to run within Juju. Juju will give me a unique identifier for that, and I can then fetch the results and status of that action over time. So I can see it's queued, it's now progressing, it's error, it's passed, and any data that the actions returned back, any output. Um, and this is the example creation, much like the metadata YAML file, this is just an action YAML file to define a task, the description, and then any parameters that need to be run with that task. Uh, configuration, which is the next set of things alphabetically in our charm. So configuration is how you take the services, well, the services configuration, the service options, the service, anything you want to do for managing that service and elevate and expose that to the user. So instead of having to say distill every single thing. Speak it to the mic. Oh, hey, sorry. I, I just hear my voice in my head, so it's really loud. Um, oh. So configuration allows you to expose service configuration and options for service, or multiple services, or anything you're managing within a charm code. Uh, so what you get with configuration is uh, several things. Um, the first is you don't always have to do things like expose MySQL, as an example. It's one I, I refer to a lot because I help write some of the charm code for it. The MySQL, the MySQL service itself has hundreds of configuration options. Odds are many people will never need to change the majority of those configuration options. So what you want to look for in charms is exposing configuration options that a user or an operator would need to modify or mutate for the service to run. Uh, another thing that we look at configuration is it's not always directly a one-to-one -one correlation between an option and a configuration file and an, and an option you want the user to change. Uh, we have a lot of charms that have what we call opinionated configuration, which is uh, things like a tuning level um, or uh, a configuration option that when set would actually impact several different configuration keys or maybe even services running or entire software stacks being deployed. Uh, the OpenStack charms have a similar example where you can actually choose when deploying the charm, which version of OpenStack you want from which distribution. So you can, with the same charm, deploy from Icehouse up through uh, Kilo, now also into, uh, what's L? Liberty. Liberty, and then of course M when it opens development. So the idea is that with that configuration option, I can mutate what it means to be that service. Um, that's essentially what they have for configuration. <laughs> I thought I had something else on that, but um, it is just the ability to expose at a high level what the user may want to tweak and tune and then it allows you as a charm author to respond to those inputs and then provide the service that the user has described via configuration. Um, this could be things, installation sources like an OpenStack, this could be licensing keys, this could be things that are tweaking the actual service performance and tuning levels, this could be a number of different configuration options that you want the user to manipulate. Uh, finally, hooks. I left this one towards the very end, uh, one of the last slides. I have no idea how I'm doing on time. I talk a little too fast. Just make sure we're good. Oh, okay, yeah, we're good. Uh, no. So hooks are 
the way charms currently respond to events that are occurring within the Juju ecosystem. So when we talk about um, the events I mentioned earlier, translating the user's expression of what they want into Juju events, which then you can respond as a charm author. Um, we're going to talk a lot this week about how we're making charms better, but before we can understand why it's so much better, we must understand what currently exists and why it is kind of hard to manage. So when we talk about writing hooks, we're essentially writing and trying to hook into what can amount to be writing and calling into the system low-level kernel calls every time you want to do an operation from an application. That's kind of currently what happens with hooks. These are the raw events that are being emitted within uh, the deployment of a, of a service. Things like, um, for instance, the user says, I wish to deploy a service, and in that we'll include in queue several different events that need to be emitted to achieve that one function. Um, so examples of hooks are things like an installed event, uh, users change configuration, which correlates to a configuration changed event. You have, uh, whenever you connect two services together, those can embody several different types of events that also run. There are a wide range of, of, of hooks that execute. A couple of positive things is that hooks aren't arbitrary, they're not, they're not arbitrarily defined. Juju defines a very clear model on what hooks will be executed, um, what the naming conventions for those are. Um, as you're writing hooks, and as we're talking more about this uh, this week, hooks are written very agnostically to language. They are, anything that's executable can be a hook, so you can have a bash file, it can be in Python. We've had people write hooks in PHP and Ruby. Um, we've had a few write hooks in Golang and Rustlang. There really isn't a limitation. As long as there's an interpreter for that language or that event um, on the system, you can write the hook in that language. So. The reason why hooks are so beautiful and also so devastating is because there is really no one way to do hooks. We simply say, here's an API that we will emit events on, and you simply respond to those events as you deem fit based on what you want to do as an author's perspective, whatever language, whatever framework. Uh, because of this, there's been a lot of frameworks we've spun up. There's been a lot of different development patterns we've created. A lot of charms in our charm store are written in Bash and Python. Um, and as we've been writing more and more charms, and we've seen people developing charms for ecosystem, we've realized that there are much better ways to handle this. But I won't get too far into that, because that's actually some very exciting stuff we're working on. What I do want to cover with hooks, and what it's important from a language perspective, is that hooks themselves are just events that are being emitted. That's the one thing you can take away. They're just simply responding to events. And those events, there's never really a set cycle of when an event can occur. Since we're managing the life cycle of a service over time, you never know when a user is going to change configuration. You never know when they're going to initiate a new relation. And as such, uh, you never know the number of times a hook may be executed. You never know when a hook will be executed. Uh, so a couple of things Juju guarantees is that on a single machine, you'll never have two hooks running at one time. And you'll never know the number of times a hook may be executed in the life cycle. So as such, uh, hooks must instill some level of item potency where even things like the installation event could be emitted multiple times during a deployment. Um, so installation must be item potent. And, and as, as an example, if you create a Linux user on the system during installation, if you attempt to recreate that user, the installation hook will fail because that command will fail once there's an existing user. So when I talk about things like item potency, I don't mean the true mathematical sense of item potency where given the exact same inputs, you produce the exact same output without any entropy into that, entered into that process. But what I mean is that Hooks must reliably run through each time without failing because of a previous hook invocation that was run there. Um, so doing things like checking for existing values, checking for steps you've already pr processed, and then working around them inside of hooks. Uh, finally, tests. Um, so testing is something that we've been pushing quite hard for the last year, year and a half now. Um, the idea is that these are actually software projects, so having testing ensures quality. And most importantly, since these are not just software projects, but software projects being reused across multiple different deployments and systems, having tests in charms help ensure that that charm actually is operating throughout time, whether there's a change in the underlying cloud, with a change in Juju, or whether there's a change in the ecosystem around the charm. We can validate and assert that it's always functioning as you, the author, as intended. Um, tests come in different shapes and sizes, just like Everything else with the Juju, we leave the opinion on how to do it to you. Um, but what we see most is charms usually embody one or more different means of testing. Uh, for those who've been writing Python charms, if you've ever looked at 
the big data charms or the OpenStack charms. They're written mostly in Python. They use Python unit testing to give them cheap and reliable ways to assure their code changes are actually the, um, compatible with what they've written. Um, we also include a idea of integration testing through tooling, which allows you to describe, this is my service, this is how it should be deployed, and then I can write assertions against that deployment to ensure that it is running as I, the author, have intended. Um, so we see a lot of charms including, almost all of them include some sort of semblance of functional testing that we then execute regularly in our testing environment. And a lot of them also include things like unit testing and stuff based on what they're used, what the authors used to doing as far as projects. A lot of the Python charms, uh, some of the Rust Lang charms have their own unit testing code, or the Ruby charms as well. With that, uh, I didn't run out of time. <laughs>